Welcome to week six. In this week, we will cover two somewhat different topics. First, we will look at Laplacian eigenmaps, a method for nonlinear manifold learning, completing what you learned last week. Then we will move on to look at weak learners, in particular decision trees, which are an essential component of ensemble learning methods. So this is rather a week in two halves. For the first part, Laplacian eigenmaps, there will be one video lecture supported by a short formative exercise to be completed in your IDE and followed by a quiz. Your learning objectives here are to gain a strong intuition for the reasons why you would want to use nonlinear manifold learning and as such be able to define the conditions under which it would be needed over and above linear dimensionality reduction techniques such as PCA and ICA. We will then go through the steps of how to implement a basic version of Laplacian eigenmaps from scratch and you will be expected to be able to replicate this. In the second part of the week we will define what is meant by weak learners and look in detail at decision stumps and trees. You will be expected to be able to calculate and implement the weak learning rules information gain and Gini index by hand. And the end goal of this week's tutorials will be that you can implement a decision tree algorithm from scratch in Python. As always we will also learn how to implement both methods in scikit-learn. Let's get started with Laplacian eigenmaps. As we discussed last week, the key difference between linear dimensionality reduction techniques such as PCA and ICA and non-linear manifold learning techniques is that linear methods consider Euclidean distances between all points as meaningful. The data is transformed to and from the Euclidean domain. On the other hand, non-linear approaches assume that the data lies on some curved domain or surface embedded within a higher dimensional space. On this domain, Euclidean distances are only meaningful locally. We showed that for a simulated Swiss roll dataset, 3D Euclidean distances are a problem because they create shortcuts between points that are in fact a long way apart on the original 2D plane on which the data was originally created. Obviously, the Swiss roll simulation is quite artificial, but there are lots of reasons to think that these manifolds exist in real world data. This is because datasets which reflect biological or physical processes are often constrained to a lower degree of freedom which reflects the laws of physics under which they were generated. For example, last week we talked about how a dataset of multiple camera shots collected for piecing together into a panorama are constrained to an almost three-dimensional space which reflects the physical constraints under which the photographs were collected, specifically the rotational movement of the photographer in 3D space. Similarly, reconstruction noise from a sequence of medical images may be removed by exploiting the physical constraints of the motion. So here, the neighbouring points on this manifold reflect data points, in this case images, which are most similar. So by unrolling these manifolds, we are able to rediscover these physical relationships between the data points. To explain why we can't do this with linear methods, let's try looking at what happens when we seek to interpret the Swiss roll dataset with a linear method such as PCA. Go to Keats and download the Python script corresponding to exercise 1. Let's open it and run Spider. You can hopefully see that it plots the Swiss roll dataset. Note, the data is designed to vary fastest along x, so I can tell you that your first PCA eigenvector will align largely with the x-direction. However, what about in the yz axis? To view this more closely, you can rotate the plot view by uncommenting this line. So we know that PCA seeks the directions in which the data varies fastest. In what direction do you think it will be in this case? Try stopping the video and implementing PCA for this dataset using scikit-learn, specifically by changing these two lines and then uncommenting the plotting code to see the result. So, if we implement PCA, and then fit 
and transform the data. And uncomment the plotting code, we get the following result. What do you think is wrong with this projection? To answer this question, stop the video and complete the first question in the Keats quiz. So, PCA is unsuited to modelling this data as it seeks to project the data onto a new Euclidean plane under which the variance is maximised. And if we consider the plane through YZ under which the variance is maximised, then it corresponds to this red arrow. And if we project all our data parts onto that plane, then we get the following result. That is that data points from different parts of the spiral project on top of one another. Specifically, the dark blue projects on top of the light green. This does not recover the 2D plot that we originally simulated, which is this. So manifold learning techniques are instead trying to recover an embedding which reflects the true geodesic distances between points along the curved surface. It does this by assuming that Euclidean distances are only valid locally and ignores the Euclidean distances between distant points, for example, this distance here. These geodesic distances can be estimated by creating what is known as the nearest neighbour graph, connecting points only to the points very close by, for example, as follows. This means that you're only connecting points together at a scale where Euclidean distances between points are close enough to the distances along the curved surface. The geodesic distance between distant points may then be recovered by estimating the shortest path between points in this graph. Stepping from point to point along the connected edges between neighbours. To estimate a k-nearest neighbour graph, you must first decide on what k you're going to use. Then what you need to do is estimate the squared Euclidean distances between points. That will return you a n by n full adjacency matrix, where n is the number of points. Subsequently, you then need to set the k nearest distances to 1, where you exclude the distance between a point and itself. So that means that the diagonal of a will always be zeros. Once you've done that, set all the other distances to zero. Typically, you want a to be symmetric, so that means that if the index at ij is 1, then you want the index at ji to be 1. This can be achieved using the numpy maximum function and passing it a and a transpose, which, as you will see on Tuesday's tutorial, sets the index of a to its maximum in either of a and its transpose. So, going through this process for a small data set with six examples of feature dimension 2, what we first need to do is estimate the distances between all points and the first one. So this is the point 4, 3. So that's imagine that we've created a broadcast version of this point, And then we subtract the difference between it and x to give this result. But we're looking for the squared distance. So we need to multiply this distance matrix by itself. And then add the totals for each row. And this will give us the squared distances between the first point and all of its neighbours. So very specifically, we're going through the process of calculating the squared distance between two points, i and j, using Pythagoras' rule. Calculated from the squared difference in the y-axis and the squared difference in the x-axis. So if we do this for all points, then we get a row vector of distances for each sample. So now A is a 6 by 6 matrix containing all the distances between all pairs of points, which is obviously symmetric. 
If we then say that we want a k nearest neighbour graph with k as 2, then what we need to do is find the two shortest distances for each row, shown here. Then what we need to do is set all the other distances to 0 and the neighbours to 1. And the final thing we need to do is make it symmetric which returns the following result where you will see that you subsequently end up with some rows with more than two neighbours. So this gives us our k nearest neighbour adjacency matrix. However, our goal with embedding is then to find a new Euclidean spacing of points which will preserve these local neighbourhoods. The Laplacian eigenmaps method specifically does this by minimising the following cost function. Where A here is the k nearest neighbour adjacency matrix that we just calculated, and y represents the embedding coordinates. From this, hopefully you can see that c will be minimised if, when a i j is high, such that the points in the original space are close, then y i minus y j will be low, meaning that the points are also close in the embedding space. There are, however, a few small problems with this specific cost function. Can you tell what they are? Try pausing the video and answering this in the Keats quiz. So the issue is that there are trivial solutions where all points get mapped to the same point in space, either zero or some other location where yi equals yj. This we do not want. But what has this got to do with the Laplacian? And in fact, what is the graph Laplacian? Well, if we multiply out this expression and then substitute in for the sum of A over each column as D, where D here is a diagonal matrix representing the degree of each vertex or node, in other words, the total number of neighbours that each node has, then we can see that this reduces to an expression uh, in D minus A, which is otherwise known as the graph Laplacian where a somewhat intuitive explanation for the graph Laplacian is that it can be seen as a discrete approximation of the Laplace operator, which describes diffusion of a material across a surface. Thus, the Laplacian can find geodesics across a surface by simulating the process of diffusion between neighbours on a graph. Here, the eigenvectors and spectra encode the harmonics of the manifold, so an analogy for this is to imagine that waves of diffusion cross the surface and get slowed down by bottlenecks in the graph. These bottlenecks are where there are weaker connectivity, generally between different components, and for shape modelling this can be used to separate out different regions, for example the heads, legs and tails of animals. And so what we seek with Laplacian eigenmaps is simply to represent the embedding using solely the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian. The derivation for this, which is not necessary to know, simply solves the cost that we saw before, subject to a constraint which prevents all points from being mapped onto the origin, where y equals zero. This constrained optimization problem can be represented in the following way, which is known as the Rayleigh quotient, for which the solution is the eigenvector of L corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue. However, this runs into a further snag because the smallest eigenvalue of the graph Laplacian is always zero and this always corresponds to a constant eigenvector, which strikes another trivial solution where all points get mapped to the same location. Therefore, a second constraint is added to prevent this trivial solution, resulting in the solution that you are seeking being a solution corresponding to the next smallest eigenvector eigenvalue pairs. This means that under the assumption that you have a fully connected graph where there are no completely disconnected clusters and that you're only seeking a 2D embedding, that it will be given by the second and third smallest eigenvectors of L. However, in a more general case, where you seek an ND embedding and you do not know the connectivity of the graph a priori, then you must identify the N eigenvectors corresponding to the N smallest eigenvalues above zero. And importantly, the eigenvectors themselves define the embedding, so there is no need to project the data onto them as you did with PCA. So in Tuesday's tutorial, we will go through the steps of implementing this from scratch for the Swiss Roll dataset, and we will then do the same thing for scikit-learn. Note that for the reasons we described before, relating the eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian to the spectra of the Laplace operator, 
Many people, including the Psychic Learn team, refer to the Laplacian eigenmaps embedding method as spectral embedding. Therefore, to run Laplacian eigenmaps in Scikit Learn, you need the spectral embedding method from the manifold class. And another very important thing to note is that rather than estimating the eigenvectors of the standard graph Laplacian, Scikit-Learn estimates the eigenvectors of the normalised graph Laplacian, as this has been shown to lead to more stable solutions where degree is not distributed evenly across all points. So that's it for Laplacian eigenmaps. Remember that non-linear manifold learning methods seek a low dimensional embedding which preserves the geodesic distances along the manifold and that Laplacian eigenmaps, also known as spectral embedding, is just one such approach. In summary, the steps for achieving a Laplacian embedding are as follows. First, you must estimate the squared distances between all points, and then use these to calculate the k nearest neighbour adjacency graph A, setting the k nearest neighbours to 1 and making all other values, including the values on the diagonal, 0. You then must make this symmetric. From A, you then calculate the degree matrix D, which is a diagonal matrix summarising the degrees, or the total number of neighbours, for each vertex. From A and D, you can then estimate the graph Laplacian. And then finally, to retrieve the embedding, all you need to do is estimate the eigenvectors of the Laplacian, corresponding to the n smallest eigenvalues above zero, Remember that robust implementation will in fact solve the generalised eigenvector problem corresponding to the normalised Laplacian. However, whether you solve the standard or normalised Laplacian will not change the fundamental interpretation of the approach. And don't forget that the embedding is represented by the eigenvectors themselves, not the projection of the data onto the eigenvectors as done for PCA. Finally, please do finish the Keats quiz before going on to the next section as it will present opportunities to test your understanding and memory of the steps involved in calculating the adjacency matrix. Thanks for your attention and I'll see you in the next video lecture.